Are you looking for a story of overcoming challenges? Are you looking for inspiration, how your life can get turned around? My name is Andy Albright. I'm in 24-7 Are You? I am president of National Agents Alliance, and today I would like to introduce you to my great friend, Marvin Osuna, who came to this country through tremendous struggles, fought for his life, fought for his family, and then joined our organization and has become extremely successful. So I want to I want to share with you as I learn more of his journey um, in America and in the uh, insurance industry. Marvin Osuna. American success story, brother. I'm trying to piece all of this together. I've heard you say different things about being from Guatemala and how you came to America, but just high level, remind me, how did you get here? Like what, what was the circumstances? And um, I know it wasn't by the book. Talk to me. Yeah, definitely. It wasn't uh, by the book. Thank you so much. This is so much fun to uh, be here and, and spend some time with you. Um, so back in the 80s, um, I'm saying uh, 1983, 1984, uh, my dad had a very successful business. Um, he had, you know, built a business from the ground up and, and he had, uh, you know, different uh, trucks. They would transport food to different parts of the country. And um he was approached in 84, um, towards the end of 1984, uh, by a group of people, a group of activists, people that were against the government at the time. And um, they said, you know, we need to come to you uh, once a month and collect some money because we need to buy weapons. We need to, uh, you know, build our, our equipment. We build our army so that we could do what we need to do. And he refused to do it. He said, no, nope, I'm not going to do that. That's that's not what I work for. And uh, Marvin, this is in, this is Guatemala, right? Yeah, this is in Guatemala and Central America. Central America. And this is over 30 years ago. Yes. And um, was it government coming to it or was it like the underground coming to him and, and kind of, I don't know if you call it extortion, but asking for money? Yeah, so um, this is what they called back in those days the guerrilla group, um, people that were against the, the government. Um, and, okay. you know, All yeah, right. they had. It wasn't, it wasn't an official group. It was a guerrilla group who was against the official group. Correct. Yeah, that's that's mainly okay. what it was. And so um, they wanted to buy weapons. So they would always do that. They would come to business owners. Um, you know, extortion, they would do whatever, whatever they could do to get money that way they could buy weapons from other countries and everything. So he refused to do it. And uh, about a week later, my mom noticed that there was a black suburban parked across the street from our house. So over there in Guatemala, anytime you'd see a black suburban for any number of days, you know, close to somebody's house, dark windows and everything, you know, that meant that the the end was coming, that, you know, something was going to happen to one of the members of that family. Um, and so, you know, my dad was traveling at the time and my mom called and said, do not come home. They're waiting for you. They come and park their car here for X number of hours, you know, every day. And um, they're just waiting for you to return. So do not come home. And so, um, you know, this is what I found out later. They weren't telling any of the kids, you know, what was going on. We're just going to school, living our normal lives. Um, I was so what age were you in? Yeah, I was 11 years old at the time. Yeah. Um, so, you know, one night um, I noticed that everybody was packing. And um, I remember asking, you know, where are we going? Because I was used to you know, going on trips with the family, you know, my dad made good money. So, you know, thank God we would travel around and have fun and everything. But um, they said, well, you know, this time we get to uh, travel to the U.S. And um, once we're there, we're going to take you guys to Disneyland. So, you know, they were trying to make it seem like, yeah, it was going to be a lot of fun. So I got excited. My little sister got excited, you know, 
there's five of us kids and I'm the fourth. Um, I have three older sisters and I have one younger sister. And so, you know, being 11 years old and, you know, hearing about Disneyland, you know, of course you get super excited. So I started packing my clothes and they said, there's a chance that we might be there for a long time. So, you know, get whatever you can and take it, put it in your bag if it fits. So I remember grabbing a couple toys, you know, and putting those in my bag, my favorite toys, which is so weird. It was a couple of wrestlers that I had bought in Mexico during one of our trips to Mexico. Um, and so I put those in my bag, um, you know, and then we got on the bus and it was probably two in the morning. Uh, when we got on the bus, I remember it was very dark. We didn't sleep that night. And so that's basically what you had to do. You had to flee in the middle of the night, you know, before, you know, the, the people would show up in the morning. So, um, took off. I remember we traveled for hours until we got to the border. Uh, we had, uh, Mexican passports. And so, um, you know, we could travel through Mexico at the time. So, um, you know, we took off, you know, went through Mexico and basically just rode the bus the entire way. Um, unfortunately, what happened was that, um, you know, through us, you know, crossing Mexico and going through the different cities, we came to a place uh, in Mexico where my father was detained and he was asked to give up all his money. And they said, if you don't give us all your money, and then this was, you know, um, uh, the law out there in Mexico. He said, well, you guys are from Guatemala. So he said, yeah, but we got our passports and, you know, they're legal here in, in Mexico. And they're like, well, not to us. So if you don't want us to keep the women here in jail, you know, uh, for a long time, then, um, you know, give us your money. Uh, if not, you can't go or, or they can't go. We'll keep all the women and the kids. And so, of course, you know, my dad, he had to give him everything he had. So uh, that was like halfway through our trip. And so, you know, from that point on, you know, he was thinking, what are we going to do? It was, you know, the seven of us plus one of my aunts decided to travel with us plus two of my cousins uh, that my dad, you know, um, he decided to bring them with us because they were suffering over there. So there was like, you know, nine of us or 10, something like that. And so um, no money, you know, we're in the middle of Mexico. And so my dad decided to go to a church. We talked to a pastor, told him our situation. And we stayed in uh, someone's house for like three to four days. And they bought us a ticket, a bus ticket from, from that town all the way to the, the border, the U.S. border. <clears throat> so, you know, 1984, when you don't have um, a visa to come to the U.S., um, the only thing that they could do at the time was, um, and fortunately for us, um, my dad's sister lived in Lake Tahoe, South Lake Tahoe in, in, the, uh, in California at the time. And she said, I'm going to pay for somebody to get you across the border. Um, and so we waited uh, in Tijuana for like three days. And uh, then I remember one evening they said, OK, you know, this is where we start our journey. So bring all your stuff. And, um, you know, we started walking, you know, these dirt roads um, up these hills, you know, through um, all these potato fields and just, you know, crazy stuff where um, I didn't know what was going on. I just knew that we were walking nonstop. So we walked all night. Um, it was very dangerous. You know, a couple of us got hurt. Um, you know, I remember I was trying to uh, wipe the mud off of my shoe. I was hitting my my shoe on a uh, on a board inside of this shed where we were just resting for a few minutes and uh, i didn't know that there was a nail sticking up and and as i you know hit the board or kick the board the nail went through my shoe um you know and it pierced my foot it was very painful and we just we couldn't stop we couldn't do anything we had to keep walking um and so it was about six in the morning, you know, walking all night with the entire family. And uh, we were detained in a place called San Isidro. Uh, that's the border, you know, right before you get to San Diego. 
Um, so we were detained by immigration. They said, um, you know, um, you don't have all your papers, so we're going to take you to this family detention center. So then they took us to San Diego. There was a place in San Diego. Um, it was a huge hotel. Back then it was called El Cortez Hotel. Um, and they turned it into a detention center for families. So the way it works is that if you come in and you're an adult, right? If, you know, the guys, they get sent to a different, you know, uh, jail, different prison where they just have all the guys and then the same thing for girls. But when you have a family, when you have little kids, they would take you to this place, which is crazy because that place is now a church. My dad started, uh, you know, sharing, you know, about his faith with people in, in that detention center. And they would gather like 40, 50, 90 people um, twice a week. Um, and he was, you know, sharing about faith and hope and God and everything. And I remember it was just, you know, a really cool experience. You know, of course, like I said, you know, I was 11. So um, a lot of times I was just like, oh, this is fun. You know, this is exciting. This is something new. You know, we're trying new foods and everything else. Um, so after a month, uh, my aunt uh, paid a fine for us to to be able to get out and um, and come up to Lake Tahoe. And then after that, we were in court proceedings for for a number of years, um, in which uh, my dad was uh, applying for what's called political asylum. So that's when they give asylum or protection to people who. Um, who have life-threatening situation, situations in their country. And um, we're just going to court, you know, and it was kind of, you know, and it's when I think about it, it's kind of like a movie because um, my sister and I, we were thrown into, when, when we came up to Tahoe, we were thrown into this ESL program, English as a Second Language. There was a, a elementary school who had a very, that had a very intense um english program where you were learning english like eight hours a day and they were just they weren't just throwing you into classes like they do most of the kids in almost every school you just go in there and you're not understanding what they're saying so you're just sitting there just nodding your head you know um they would take us to a separate room one-on-one -on -one, working with teachers and within about six months we were able to understand almost everything that people were saying um so that was really cool. But uh, going to one of those uh, court hearings in San Francisco, because we would always travel with my dad, you know, and then we sit right behind them, behind him and, and the attorney. Um, I remember uh, my dad's attorney uh, showing some letters to the judge, you know, letters that would come from Guatemala from family members saying, you know, be careful, don't come back because this person came and they were looking for you. They were asking where you went, stuff like that. And um, I remember the attorney or the uh, judge asking the attorney, so uh, do you think at this point that they would qualify for political asylum? And my dad's attorney, the person that, that they had been paying for such a long time, she said, um, no, your honor, I don't think that they have enough evidence to qualify for political asylum. So. You know, if you need to deny the case and send them back, you know, that's completely up to you. She didn't know that my sister and I were understanding every word she was saying. So uh, we told our parents, you know, after the court hearing, you know, they they decided to fire her and, and you know, find other ways to to appeal, you know, the judge's decision. So for a number of years. Um, they were filing appeals and, you know, having court hearings. So, you know, by this time, you know, I'm like 15, 16, I started to notice like what was going on. Um, and so at one point they said, okay, um, you have um, this, um, it was kind of like a penalty, uh, you know, for, for this particular uh, situation or application. They said, you have to remain inside the country for a number of years. You cannot leave the country. And, um, you know, during that time, my dad was always, you know, trying to find ways to, to get things right, to, to set things up the right way for us. So he hired another person out of Sacramento that was, um, 
you know, working on his case and trying to, to get him to, to become a resident. So um, they succeeded. Step one was completed. Everything was good. And then this person said, OK, now I need you to bring me the fine that immigration is going to charge for your entire family. You know, at the time, I believe that um, there was four of us at the time that my dad was applying for because my other sisters were over 18. Um, and so she said $2,000 per person. So, you know, back in like, I don't know, um, 89, 90, my dad had to come up with $8,000 in, in fines so that she could send that money to immigration. Well, he brought the money to her. She lived in California. Didn't hear from her for another, like, I don't know, two or three weeks. So then my dad and I decided to go visit this person, kind of like a paralegal, <clears throat> no longer there. Um, she had an office at home. Uh, the house was empty. I guess she did the same thing to a bunch of people, just said, you know, immigration is asking for $2,000 a piece. So, you know, she probably took tens of thousands of dollars. And so... Um, they denied my dad's application again because um, he didn't file uh, everything on time and and didn't pay the, the, the fines. So, you know, that created another, uh, for us, you know, like another 10, 20 years of just trying to apply, trying to get things right. And, you know, by the grace of God, um, I feel that, you know, being part of this company and, um just having those aspirations, you know, to, to travel and to, to do better. And, um, you know, we started making money more than ever before, because before we used to make enough money just to pay our bills. You, you skipped 20 years right there for me, bro. So <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you were taking me through month by month and then we skipped 20 years. I know. So, <laughs> so let's back up a little bit. All right. So, so your family basically escapes persecution in Guatemala. Um, I, I would call it po political persecution because you had this um, guerrilla group and then the government group and you didn't want to didn't look like y'all didn't want to pick sides and decide just get get the heck out of the country. Yeah. Is that a fair is that a fair summary? That's correct. And your dad, like he wasn't like going to stand for the government and he wasn't going to fight against them either. He's like, we're out of here. We're going to America. Correct. Because, um, you know, that would have been like that same week if we hadn't left. That would have been a situation where you pull up to your house and then like six to seven people step out of uh, that suburban and they go get in our car. And then that's the last time you see that person. So so it was very close. Um, okay. And I mean, of course, this is you reflecting back at the time you're oblivious. You think y'all are going to Disney world in America. Correct. Um, and now you look back and you realize you about lost your dad. Now is your dad is, it, is your dad, how is, what's, is your dad passed now? Yeah. So, um, he passed in 98. So, um, it was, so he would have got maybe seven or eight years here in America. Yeah. So um, he had lived here before um, in the 70s. He had lived in Fort Worth, Texas. Um, okay. So that's that's kind of like how he rebuilt his businesses. He came here to work. And of course, he had a, a working visa at the time um, that he could come and work for six months or so. And that's how so he had start. He had start kind of establishing himself as a, in America prior to leaving Guatemala permanently. Correct. So at one point you said they took all his money. Would that would would that mean he had everything he was carrying with him? Bank accounts? Did he lose bank accounts? Did he lose all of his wealth? Or was it just like what he had on him? How did that work? So um, before before we left, they sold everything we had, and um, and then there was a couple things that his family members were supposed to sell because, of course, you know, he didn't have time. But back in those times, you know, you wouldn't carry things like credit cards. That was kind of like it wasn't a, a foreign, um, I guess, concept. But 
uh, you couldn't really carry credit cards anywhere because they weren't really accepted, you know, in like Latin American yeah, countries. They carry cash. They didn't have a crypto and have a, a wallet they could carry with them. No, nope. <laughs> no. <Nope. laughs> 1980. Yeah. So you just carry we, we you know, big bills in your wallet. So all the cash that he carried between him and my mom to take care of all the travel expenses and, and stuff like that, um, it was taken away. I don't think people understand um, what can happen in a country if things go bad. Bank accounts, cash value, like if you've got equity in property and they obtain the property, you can lose every. It's possible you can lose everything like that. You, you looking back, you saw this happen. Oh my gosh! Um, once I started learning about it, you know, as as I got older. Um, you know, it was very scary because you'd hear about it all the time, you know, from other people saying, oh, this person, you know, got killed and that person got killed. You know, I remember my sisters most, I'm going to say like 70 percent of the people that they went to school, you know, got killed. And uh, it was either um, people robbing them or, you know, just it was a very violent time, I guess. Um you know, to, to say the least in the 90s. Um, and so I know that it would have been the end for my dad if we had not left. So so you get through, you're in America, you're becoming a young adult. What would you consider yourself? Would you Were you illegal? Were you an immigrant? Were you undocumented? I don't know the wording for that. Or what did you consider yourself? Like, could you get jobs? Was it difficult for you as a young adult? Um, what was your status? You know what? Um, at the time, um, growing up, I didn't consider myself uh, undocumented um, because th this is kind of funny. Uh, and when I tell people this, they go like, you did what? So um, when my aunt paid the fine for us to get out um, and start working in this uh this long process, immediately what they did, which I don't know, I don't think they do it now, but what they did is they granted my mom and my dad work permits. And uh, this covered like the entire family. So with these work permits, we were allowed to apply for a social security card, um, you know, with the social security administration. So we had, okay. we had work permits and we had um social security cards we didn't have green cards but we had these other two documents and so for us um you know the reason why i said it was funny is because uh my sister and i the second week that uh we moved to, to lake tahoe you know like i said i was still 11 my older sister she was like 14. um we went across the street to like a little motel in front of the apartment complex and we asked the guy there for a job and he's like, oh, sure. I need somebody to, you know, clean the rooms and, and do the laundry and stuff like that. So her and I were the first ones who got jobs here. So I started working at 11 years old. <laughs> um, and so we go every day. So, so you considered yourself an American. I mean, Hey, I'm, I'm here to go to work. I'm, I work here. Like I got a social security card. I got documents. I'm good. Yes. Um, so you didn't see yourself, as, you didn't see yourself as in a predicament. You thought everything's fine. You're going to work, you're making money. Dad's making money. Yeah. As a teenager, you know, I grew up without any, any of those fears. Um, you know, I did, I think the first time that it really hit me and, um, and I was like, whoa, uh, I don't think I'm going to be accepted for a lot of different things. And, and I started to worry about it was uh, right before graduating high school, you know, uh, an army recruiter came to the school and I was going to sign up. I was going to enlist, you know, but he said, do you have, do you have a green card? Do you have citizenship and stuff like that? And, and I asked and they're like, no, we just have these two documents. And so I told the guy, and I don't know if, you know, if, if he knew that you could do something or, or not, but he said, oh, okay, I'm sorry, then you're not eligible to, you know, to look into this. 
So um, that's when I felt like, oh my God, you know, I'm being rejected. So there is a problem. So you would have been, you would have been 18 years old in that neighborhood. Correct. Wow. That must be just a sinking feeling to think you know, I, I'm lost. I'm in this country and I can't even join the military. Yeah, because I, I I wanted to. I felt you know that that I needed to serve and and you know if we go back to that time that was 1991. That was in the middle of the Gulf War. That was when you know Iraq happened, all that stuff. So um, I felt the need, like many of my friends, to to go and serve. Wow. That's a lot, bro. Um, so did you end up going to college? What did you end up doing the next few years right out of high school? So, you know, my number one plan, like I said, was military. That didn't work out. So uh, second plan was uh, I wanted to become either an engineer or uh, a technician, electronics technician. And so um, I decided to sign up for school. I was going to go to Arizona and go to school there. Um, but for some reason, you know, towards the end, right before leaving, um, I just had this feeling that it just wasn't right for me. Like I didn't want to do that for the rest of my life. So I had a conversation with my dad and he said, well, you know, whatever you want to do, we'll support you. And so I just started working, you know, just different jobs, delivering auto parts, working in restaurants, just doing different things. And my mom said, you know, you got to prepare yourself. So whatever, if, if you don't want to go to that school, that's fine, but you got to do something. You got to, you know, and, and I'm going to support you. I'm going to help you, you know, pay for it, whatever we got to do, you know, because they always had two jobs. They always wanted to make sure that we had everything we needed. And so um, I signed up in this uh, modeling school and um, I started learning how to, to act and, and model and stuff like that. And so she paid for that whole thing. She paid for singing lessons. You know, she just, she said, okay, you want to be an artist? Okay, I'm, I'm going to help you. And so after I graduated, I started working in like different projects, different films you know, first as an extra, then I was getting some feature parts here and there. Um, so I was on my way to becoming an actor. Like, I, I think like long-term, that's what I wanted to do. Um, but then I started getting some parts that didn't really go with, you know, like <laughs> my beliefs and stuff. I'm like, ah, I don't want to be seen like this, you know, 20 years from now. So um, then uh, I got a job. I remember, um, Right when I graduated from, from that school, I got a job at a credit union um, and took some finance classes with the credit union. They were paying for those finance classes. And um, so what, what, age, what age would you have been when you started doing that? Um, 19, about to turn 20. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you you basically figured out at this point in your life that hey i'm not going to college i'm not going to military i just got to figure this thing out whether it's modeling where it's whether it's banking finance like i got to find a career that's what i'm feeling is this kind of give me in your head how was you feeling like 19 20 years old and you thinking your options are limited what was your feeling what was your thinking you know, at the time, I was very grateful because uh, the bank where I started working at, it was a, a credit union. They accepted my work permit, the, the only work permit that I had. I was really old, but they accepted it. And of course, you know, Social Security card, there was no problem. So uh, I felt grateful. And because they gave me room to grow, I was able to go from teller to customer service to uh, supervisor to branch manager. And then they had me open different branches around town until I became uh, a business developer. So I would go and enlist these businesses to come in and, and have their employees join the, the credit union. So I ended up being a business development officer towards the end. So I felt like like I had a good, so great, pretty good career path, you know. Grateful, grateful and willing to work. That's what I'm hearing. Grateful, willing to get after it, ready to compete. Um, yeah. Did you feel like you were being 
two things. Did you feel like you were compensated well when you when right then? Did you feel like it? And then looking back now, do you realize you were paid less, more? Like how did you feel then? And then what looking back, how would you compare it? You know, uh, that is a great question, Andy, because um, I thought I was getting paid well at the time. And because I was part of the executive team, um, I'm right. going, OK, maybe, you know, I'm making close to what everybody else is making, all the other managers. Um, and I don't know what this was, but the uh, president of the bank, he came into my office and he said, you know what? Uh, my disk drive isn't working. Can I use your computer for a little bit? And I said, yeah, that's fine. So um, he went in there, put in, you know, that floppy disk that we used before, he put it in there, started typing some stuff. And then he printed a couple forms and he took out the disk and he left. He said, oh, thanks, you know. Um, but unfortunately, he didn't close the document. So the document was still up on the computer, you know. And all I did is... Um, you know, I opened the, the screensaver and the document was right there in front of me. So what I saw uh, really shocked me because everybody that was in the same, you know, executive level where I was, uh, was getting a bonus. He was typing up the bonuses for the end of the year. And I was getting 10% of what everybody else was getting. And so I started thinking, you know, what the heck? I'm doing a great job. You know, is it because I'm different from everybody else? Is it because, you know, um, I wasn't born in this country? Like, what is it? Because I didn't see anything different as far as uh, the position where I was. So then that's when I started, you know, second guessing, you know, this this career path and just said, you know, I don't want to be looked at differently um, and even though I'm performing, I, I need to get paid for my performance rather than, you know, what I look like. I think, I think too, more than just your career path, because you've had this conversation with me in the past that you didn't feel like, I don't know, worthy is the word, or you didn't feel like you were going to be treated fairly. And so like when you came to us, you had some of these I don't, image problems, some of this history that was weighting you down. Definitely. I think it started there, Andy. And, um, you know, maybe like six months later, somebody offered me um, an opportunity in insurance. I kept saying no because I, I had a different concept of insurance sales. And so I kept saying no. But after six months of them going after me, I said, OK, I'll, I'll listen to what you have to say. And so the part where you make a difference with insurance, like really got me hooked and um, right. I started working, but it was more within the, you know, the same community, you know, Spanish speaking people and stuff like that. So right. I didn't I didn't feel any difference. It wasn't until I started working uh, just mainly with people who were responding to final expense or or mortgage needs, mortgage protection needs that I started to feel a little bit different, like maybe. I'm not at the level of uh, where everybody else is at. So I, I did feel that at, at one point. So um, let's talk about just, just skip. Boom, boom, boom. You're in your twenties. What was your high level jobs or careers? Just, just kind of the title, just a little subtitle. Yeah, definitely. So um, through, I would say late twenties and early thirties, my career was um, life insurance agent. I was a captive agent. At the same time, okay. I was working uh, with our church. My dad started a church in 96, so I was working as a youth pastor in the church. Okay. And um, at the same time, I was going to wrestling school because I wanted to also become a professional wrestler. I always, for some reason, I always had that dream. And so I started to pursue that on the side. So we're talking mask, tight shorts, throwing each other on ring ropes and body slamming and all that fun stuff, WWE type stuff today. But back in the day, it was something else. Exactly. It was what they called uh, independent uh, territories. 
of wrestling. Jim, Jim Prockett Promotions, WRAL. Exactly, AWA, all those types of uh, of organizations. You know, we everybody had their territory, and so we travel from territory to territory and and wrestle with different uh, people every night. So you're an insurance agent, youth pastor, and a wrestler all at the same time. <laughs> yes. When you say it like that, it does kind of make you laugh. Oh, right? yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was fun, wasn't it? Getting in that ring with the big boys. Who's the most famous people you wrestled? Some of the most uh, famous names that I got in the ring with were um, Greg the Hammer Valentine, who uh, he's still alive. He's he's from North Carolina. Um, Jim Neidhart from the Heart Foundation. He's from Canada. Um, Val Venus, who was also a wrestler from the Attitude Era. Um, and my last match was going to be against um, Rey Mysterio, but he had an incident in Mexico where one of the wrestlers died in the ring, and so he quit wrestling. So um, I didn't have that that dream match that I was supposed to have with him because he was, you know, more of a modern superstar where, you know, you once you wrestle with people like that, then your name starts getting out more and everything. So um, just things that you look so forward no Black to. Black Jack Mulligan, no Ric Flair, no Ricky Steamboat. No. So at the time when I was um, when I was already um you know, uh, like really getting my name out there. And, and I had the heavyweight championship, which I held for like nine months. Um, they would bring people in that had a, a big name and or they were a wrestling legend. Um, but I think at the time, Steamboat and Flair were already working as producers for their big companies, the, the bigger, you know, uh, wrestling companies. And so they were working behind the scenes you know, but I would have loved to have gotten in the ring with people like Ricky Steamboat or, you know, uh, Ric Flair, you know, for that matter, for sure. Okay, so you're more West Coast, I'm more East Coast too, so it's a lot of names depending on where people are from. So, um, so Captive, who, so that's like where you only got a very limited product line, don't have a lot of leads or, or you don't, you're really kind of, it seems tied down to me. Looking back, is do you see it as that? Oh my gosh, um, it's like night and day because as a captive agent, you only have two products to work with. If the person doesn't qualify for any of those two products, they get declined, and we can't help them at all. You know, so like half of the people that I wrote, I would have to call them back and be like, "Sorry, bro, but you have high blood pressure." Like, no, I don't have high blood pressure. I have white coat syndrome, which means that when you get in front of a, a person in the medical field, you get nervous and your heart, your blood pressure goes up and they're like, I'm okay. <laughs> and I'm like, I know you're okay, but they're saying you can't get insurance. I'm sorry. So I did that for like, you know, over 10 years. When you're limited, when you're limited like that, don't you feel like now looking back, it's a disservice to your clients? Oh my gosh, a hundred percent because Looking back, I know that we could have helped every single one of those people. So they were getting turned down left and right for things that were just silly. You think about them now, and it was like, oh, borderline cholesterol, they would get declined. And we had no leads. The idea of a lead was, um, hey, Marvin, uh, you want leads? And I'd be like, yeah. And boom, they dumped the big phone book, you know, all the white pages on top of my my little cubicle, my, my desk and be like, all right, here's your leads. Go again. So, so there was no marketing, no direct mail, no internet marketing, no telemarketing, no search engine optimization, no Google, no AdWords, nothing like that. Oh my gosh. No. Uh, the only thing that no seminars, was, no mailing or seminars or nothing, nothing like that. Because after your first two weeks of training, they kind of like let you go. So there's no meetings, there's no training, there's there's nothing. They just send you one one tape, one cassette or one CD a month and like, hey, listen to this. But other than that, nobody nobody really cared. So so during this time, you get married, you have three beautiful kids, you're growing a family. You're not you're not elaborate, but you're growing a family, right? You're making a living. You're scratching out a space on this 
in this country? Yeah, you know, at the time, I think that the most I made was $79,000 a year. So we were able to, you know, uh, buy a house, you know, it was custom built. So we got to choose all the, you know, the, the nice things about the house, you know, the features and everything. So we were doing okay. Um, and then 2008, okay. after you're old. You're in America. Oh, yeah. Eight was crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, living the dream, you know, having kids, it was a, it was an exciting time, you know, in our lives. Um, we have two boys and two girls. And so we were just super excited. But unfortunately, when you don't have a system like what you mentioned earlier, where you have leads, you work with people from all walks of life, um, you have to be specific to one market. So in order for me to be successful, you know, with the other company, I had to focus on just like one segment of the market, which for me, unfortunately, I mean, back then those were the people making money, but unfortunately builders, painters, <laughs> framers, uh, you know, people that, that were uh, cleaning yards. In other words, I was working with all the people who kind of walked away from these construction sites in 2008. Okay, so let me restate. So high level, you're, you're preaching. You got a youth pastor. You got an insurance license. Mm -hmm. You're with this captive group, very limited, and you're doing this entertainment gig called wrestling. Yeah. So it, it, is, it is real sports, but it's a lot of entertainment. So you're doing all that. You get married, four kids. You live in kind of a standard American life. It's not terrible, right? I mean, you're, it's it's a good life. You're doing good. Yes. Yeah. Standard life. I mean, you know, that we had the, the car, the house, you know, nice neighborhood. You know what I mean? And, and don't get me wrong, Andy. Um, I was always looking over my shoulder because I had heard from different people that were kind of like in the same situation where I was, where they were kind of like in limbo. And, you know, all of a sudden, uh, you know, three, four, five different police cars came to their house and they said, you know, we got to take you in because you're not, you know, legal to be here. So we're going to deport you. So I heard. So that's, that's in the back of your mind. You're still worried about all this. No doubt. Like my entire life, this, I'm talking like over 30 years, you know, living under those, those shadows. Um, did you ever try to leave the country during that time or did you just know that was a bad idea? Well, you know, earlier, um, when I was younger, it was real easy to cross the border and go to Mexico and like go to a restaurant or whatever, you know, because that's different. That's different than leaving. The country. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but you know what? Um, I really had no desire to leave the country because most of my family was here and that's when everything was changing. You know, my dad passed away. So I was more like, you know, I got to be here, take care of mom um, and my kids. Everybody was having children. So the family was growing. So I really so there was no there was no I want to go to Italy. I'd love to go to South Africa. I'd love to go to Nigeria. I'd love to no, no, I know I'd go to France. You're not thinking that you're thinking middle America or just lower, maybe lower America. Just just do my deal. No head up, head down. Exactly. And raise a family. Yeah, there, I had no dreams to travel or to do, you know, all of the amazing things that we do now. I had no ambition at all. Because in my mind, this is what I was thinking, and, and, and I'm going to get very transparent here. I don't know how much of this I can say, but um, almost every day when I open the garage to warm up the car so I could take my kids to school, I had that moment where I turned my head to see if there was like an immigration agent waiting for me outside of the house or something like that. So I always had that fear um, that at least it wasn't the black suburban you were looking for. <laughs> no, it would have been a white one, <laughs> but <laughs> just as almost as bad. Yeah. So um, 
All right. So it's just hard to get in that mindset. I mean, being born in America and, and that's what I love about my children traveling. You know, they've been to what was Rhodesia and now it's Zimbabwe and they've been to South Africa and they've been to Mexico and they've been to several different countries and they've met people like um, like Marvin Osuna and heard him talk about different things that happened in Guatemala, Guatemala. And if people like um, Olga Mathis, who who saw things happen in in Colombia, which is similar to some of the st- stuff that you've had happen to you, right. um, it's having your eyes open to what can happen and and the opportunity that we have in front of us uh, in, in being born in America, or like you now that you now you're you are full full-blown American, right? You're, <laughs> you're a citizen. You got everything now, right? Yeah. So thank God. Um, I was able to hire attorneys, you know, now that, that we're in a, in a better position where we can pay our bills and put money away or travel or do things I was able to pay. Cause it's very expensive to hire attorneys and go through this whole process, uh, which I had done before many times, but I was always denied and I would start the process all over again. So, um, so without, money, so without money, you're just stuck. Yeah. I mean, you, unless somebody gives you the money or you earn the money to pay for attorneys and fight the bureaucracy, you're, you're just kind of stuck and you just live your life. Exactly. You fit you. you live. It's not a terrible, it's not a terrible, it's not a terrible life, but it's not a dream building life. No, not at all. Uh, like you said, you just keep your head down and you hope that they don't come to your doorstep because you're afraid that if you leave your family, you're going to be stuck somewhere for about a month before they send you back. And so your family's going to suffer because you're the, you know, you're the main breadwinner. And so that was, that was my biggest fear. So like you said, I, I had really no, no ambition. I just kept my head down and, and went to work. So, um, so let's go back. So we connect a friend of mine, a friend of yours, and we ended up working together through the Alliance still in insurance, but of course now we offer a huge array of products, um, financial advice, investments. It's just so many things we offer now. But when you first got involved, you did not, I don't think you envisioned it even as good as you've done. You didn't picture it that good and what you could do with it. No, all I thought was, okay, If you're telling me that I can talk to people who actually want to hear about insurance, (laughs) because for 11 years, I talked to people who said, no, I'm not going to die, or they would give you some other weird excuse. Um, But these are people who actually want to talk about insurance. Um, I thought to myself, um, I can make a living, you know, doing this. I can at least get close to 100,000 in income if I have leads, but I did not know that we have such a huge opportunity where it doesn't matter what the person's health is, um, you know, what they're going through. I tell people, as long as you're breathing, we can cover you. Um, so it's, it's really, uh, I think, liberating for me to be able to say that because I couldn't say that for like 11 years. And so now when I talk to my clients, I'm like, I know we can cover you. So, so it's a huge opportunity just knowing that we have this, you know, this, uh, suite of products and and that everybody's welcome that that's huge not having to turn people down that was big for me and and has allowed me to triple quadruple my business you know because i was losing a lot of money turning people down you know and and of course this was after a a two-month ordeal with the blood test and and the medical reports and stuff like that because everybody that we wrote had to go through that whole fully underwritten process with where they take blood, urine, all that crazy stuff. And then two months later, sorry, you don't qualify. Um, that was hard. So, hey, but Marvin, also that you wouldn't be in judge, that you could move up, that you could make as much money. That had to, that feeling had to c- come oozing out from our organization also because of the many different, the variety, the diversity of success that you saw when you came with our organization. It was like living in a in a uh, black and white world and then you go through this curtain and everything's in color because uh, the contract I had before, and, and I'm serious, man, that's how I felt. The contract I had before as a captive agent would pay me 50% commission 
for 20 years. After 20 years, I could retire, you know, and get a little bit of money sent to me every month, which wasn't much, but um, my contract never changed. You signed a contract that said, this is my commission. And if I stay with the company, like I knew a guy that was with the company for like 50 years. He was even the mayor of Carson City, uh, you know, the capital of Nevada um, at one point. And he was still with the company when I joined after like 50 years. And he'd be like, yeah, I'm excited because we have this 50% contract. You know, it's better than 20, better than 15. And I'm like, okay, well, that's that's how insurance companies work. So when I came here and they said, no, you start higher than 50. Like what? That's my starting contract is higher than 50. Yeah. And they go, yeah. And then you can move up every month, every two months. You can make way more. And I thought, oh, my gosh, just that alone was huge for me because then I realized that I was going to be compensated based on my performance and how hard if I wanted to work hard, which I love working hard, if I wanted to do that, then there was no limitation. No discrimination, no judgment on where or your past, who your mama was from or what country you're from, or did you speak English? Not, no judgment, just based on the judgment was based on what you actually do. The result. Exactly. Yeah. That's what I fell in love excited with. Were you? Do you remember the point when you realized that about this organization and it just hit you like, I can do it too? You know, for a moment, uh, it was almost like if, if my heart skipped a beat, I said, what? So we're talking to people who want to talk about insurance. We got unlimited earning potential. We can get promoted to higher contract levels, which I didn't know existed. Um, and we can get them approved, like all these different things. Um, and you can hire people. You can build your own agency. Exactly. I'm like, man, I wish I would have found out about this when I was 23, 24, just getting into, you know, into the insurance business. Um, but, you know, you're like me. Now you got your children that are in their 20s and you're like, do you understand the opportunity that's in front of you? Right. You're you're selling. I'm selling to your children and you're selling to my children. We're going like, guys, it's huge. Definitely. Oh, my gosh. Um, so for me, it was um, like not a day. It was a huge difference. And so I saw the potential. I saw the opportunity. Don't get me wrong. I still had some of that baggage that I was carrying with me where, you know, maybe I didn't feel like I was equal to everybody else. But um, thank God, you know, that went away. I had some great counseling and I was able to um, to look at myself and say, you know what? I deserve the same as everybody else. Like if I work hard, um, there's nothing different about me. It's just in my mind. I can help people that look way different than me, taller than me, different hair color, different color eyes. It doesn't matter. They're just people and I, and they need my help. And so that was a big change for me, which it, it was kind of like taking the lid off because at that point, um, not only, you know, my production, the, the, my business grew, like there was a lot of things because then I didn't have anything holding me back. Now you're starting to see other people get this success. Are, are you seeing some um, eyelids kind of open up and kids and other people from your country and um, you seeing it start to happen to them? How, what's that feeling like for you? Oh, man. You know, um, for example, after our last convention that we had, um, had so many people walk up to me and say, you know what? We saw you up on stage and that gives me so much hope because we look alike because we have similar backgrounds because, you know, we weren't born in this country and, and English was not our first language. So that gives me so much hope knowing that this company doesn't discriminate, you know, they don't look at you and just go, okay, we'll just stay here on the side and just do your thing makes, you know, make us some money. No, they're, they're really recognizing you for your work. And so now it's, it's a great feeling to be able to open that door to many people and say, look, we have an opportunity. We are the proof that you can do really well here in this company, that you can travel with us. You know, um, it was funny because uh, I was talking to a group of people 
uh, last week in Salt Lake City. And I was telling him, you know, I remember, you know, walking the streets, trying to find clients because every day that's what you do if you don't have leads. When I was with the other company, I was walking the streets, knocking on doors, talking to business people, giving out 100 business cards a day. And I said, you know, uh, I was walking and I had holes in my shoes from walking so much. And I never thought that I could, you know, travel to places like Ireland, you know, have breakfast with you in Ireland, you know, at that beautiful hotel and looking at the castles and, and you know, learning about the Titanic and things like that. And, and now being able to travel to Guatemala, to, you know, my country where I was born um, and to show all these things to my kids and my wife and saying, hey, try this food. Hey, check this out. You know, let's let's go to let's go across the lake, you know, rent a boat, let's rent a cabin doing all those things. I mean, it it's like a dream come true. Um, if you look at the background, if you look at like, yeah, you had to leave your house in the middle of the night. You were a little kid and almost your entire life you you live with that shadow behind you just going okay is this the day when when they're going to take me what's going to happen and and now being able to travel because for some people it's like oh traveling's traveling but for me it's a dream come true because i'm able to do that now and and we couldn't do it for so many years and i don't have that fear anymore okay so marvin let's let's talk about the feeling mm -hmm of now being in a business, not alone, but with other people, but it's your business. H how does that feel to you? Um, in a sense, in my particular case, I feel protected because what this company has allowed me to do, you know, and, you know, build the, the, the financial stability to have attorneys on my side and to, to take care of my status, you know, to to correct those situations um, has made me feel like, you know, everything that the company provided has given me security. It has given me that protection that I needed uh, to make sure that my family was going to be OK. And, you know, knowing that we can see each other, you know, we can eat steak and lobster anywhere in the world. Um, <laughs> uh, just makes me feel like, yes, I am part of the family. I feel like I belong. Um, I feel just uh, grateful, you know, um, every day that I get to work and do this thing and, and help other people because I know that if I need help, I can reach out to you. I can reach out to the rest of my friends in the business. Um, and, and we're a family. It's, it's just a, a weird feeling because when I worked for the other company, nobody wanted to give out their secrets or help the other person. But over here, I feel like everybody's going here. Uh, grab my hand. I can help you. You know, this is what I'm doing. So um, so it's a great sense of peace. Nice. Yeah, for sure. Nice. Okay. So Marvin, talk to me a little bit about the view for your you and Rachel and for your children and the legacy that you live and that you leave on earth, what you now see, what's your vision now, what's your dream? Oh man, I love that question because uh, talking about legacy, I know that no matter what happens, we've been able to teach our kids, you know, to love God and family and be able to work hard. And since they started seeing us, you know, travel to, Hawaii and, and just do all these different things. As soon as they turn 18, they go, well, I want to get my insurance license too, because I see what you do. I see that, you know, you're making money. And um, it was different because I didn't have to tell any of them to join our business or to, to get their license. Cause I always told them, you know, I'll support you, whatever your dream is, I'll, I'll help you and I'll support you the same way that my parents did for me. And so, um, now that they see this opportunity, as soon as they turn 18, they're already studying without me even knowing, like they got a, a online course somewhere, I don't know where, but they're already studying because they want to get their license. And 
they see that this business has so much opportunity to where um, if they want to become art entrepreneurs or follow acting or sports or whatever it is, they know that this business is that vehicle that can provide the finances so that they can build their dream. Because a lot of people, you know, have dreams, but they never have the right vehicle or the opportunity to get there because most of the time it's because of finances. And so I love the fact that they see this business and they see the opportunity. And now they're talking about, you know, buying a house in Guatemala and buying a house in Florida and buying a place in in, in uh, uh, Hawaii and traveling around the world. You know, they, they can't wait, you know, to be able to do that. So I know that this opportunity has given Rachel and I the ability to dream bigger past that point of just making money to pay our bills, um, you know, but to, to just grow and, and allow our kids to see it. So I know that they all see it now. So it's just a matter of like, how far are they going to take it? And what is that going to do for the next generation? So that when they have kids, uh, that they can live a totally different lifestyle, you know, because before, like Rachel says, sometimes, you know, when we're talking to people about the opportunity and how we started, um, she says, you know, before we used to buy them a dollar cheeseburger at McDonald's, a dollar 29 cheeseburger so that they could go and play in the little, you know, playpen there. Um, but now I get the opportunity to tell my kids, hey, don't look at the right side of the menu. Just tell me what you want. Like, what do you, what are you craving right now? What would you like to order? And so look at the left side of the menu so that you can. So those are, you know, things that for me, they're huge because of where we were before. Um, and so uh, I have been able to see the opportunity and model the opportunity, not tell my kids so much like, hey, this is a great opportunity, but they're seeing the work every day. And they're seeing the reward um, every single day. And they're seeing us traveling and stuff like that. So they're like, that's what I want. You know, I want to do the same thing. So I love to hear that, um, you know, coming from them and just knowing that that they're going to do way better than, you know, than we did. So I, I feel I feel blessed, you know, in that aspect. Marvin, thank you so much. Congratulations on what you've done, what you've done for your family, the example you set, not just for your family, but others that don't feel like they're a perfect fit. When they feel like they're, they feel like they're being discriminated or they're going to be held down, thank you for fighting and succeeding for your family and for other families that, that get to watch you. You're on, a, you're on a bigger pedestal than just right there on your home, buddy. You're, you're on a national scene. Thank you for serving. Thank you for giving. And thank you for this interview. You've been so open and honest. And I appreciate your time. Um, you know what, Andy? I am so grateful because through this opportunity, I have been able to let just let open and just say, you know what? Because we were praying, because one time Rachel and I were crying and asking God and say, open a door for us. We didn't know that it was going to be again in insurance. And now that he said, okay, here's the door. This is the family. These people honor me. When we came in, that's really why we decided to plant our flag was because of the heart, the faith, you know, and, and the belief level. And through this opportunity, we've been able to um, take our, our kids and take them to a school where we had to pay, but it was just an amazing opportunity because they get to talk about the name of God every day without any problem, any hesitation. And that has been a huge foundation in their life. And I just want to thank, you know, my Lord and Savior Jesus for um, giving us this opportunity, for opening this door for us when we thought we didn't have any more hope, when we thought like, okay, now we just got to go and do these mediocre jobs and just do whatever we can to survive. Um, he opened this door for us. He introduced us to you and this wonderful opportunity. And um, we're just so grateful for that. So it is an answer to, to that prayer when Rachel and I were going like, where do we go from here? What do we do? Are we going to be homeless? What's going to happen? 
And he heard our prayer and uh, he opened the door to uh, this wonderful company. So, man, I'm, I'm just feeling excited and grateful for this opportunity. Amen.